All right, quick question. Would you say that every Christian should be involved in evangelism? You guys can migrate that way again. You'll bless the people on the stairs. Just migrate that way. You will bless the people on the stairs. Particularly you guys on the aisle. You can climb over people if you need to go to the bathroom. It's okay. Just migrate that way. Particularly you guys on the stairs. You will help everybody. I am going to continue to talk and use this time. Would you say that every Christian should be involved in evangelism? Raise your hand if you think yes. Now, I'm a Baptist. Now I, that feels right. Okay, now. Raise your hand if you think no. All right. Let me, let me put the screws a little more tightly. Would you say that every Christian should be evangelizing? Raise your hand if you think yes. Raise your hand if you think no. Okay. Um... Where do you get that from in the Bible? Not a rhetorical question? I intend you to answer. Where do you get that from in the Bible? Now I want a hand and a name. Church. Yep, brother. What's the name of your church? Where? Appleton, Wisconsin, Fox River Baptist Church. And your answer is? Matthew 28, the Great Commission. Okay, Jesus clearly gave that to his disciples. So you're thinking that means not ministers of the word, you're thinking that means all disciples. Go and tell. Okay, all right. That's, that's at least true by extension. There's debate about whether or not that's how that passage should be understood. I agree with you. Anybody else, other than the Great Commission, where would you go to? To, to, to teach your members that everybody should be involved in evangelism. Wait, wait, hand. Yeah. Brother, what's your name? Dave Thayer. Dave Thayer, where are you? I'm from uh, Baptist Church in Madison, South Dakota. Madison, South Dakota. Okay, brother, what's your answer? What passage? Uh, Timothy. Okay. Paul does exhort Timothy to do the work of an evangelist. Again, he's writing to a pastor. Yep. So, chapter and verse. Yep. Five what? Yeah, when you got chapter and verse, get back to me. Yeah, yeah. All right. Again, okay, all right. Any other ideas? These are verses you want to know. If we're talking about evangelism, your pastors, you want to be able to tell people why from the Bible they, they should all be evangelizing. Yeah, brother, right there. Yeah, another good passage showing the essential, uh, how essential it is to hear the good news. And therefore, we're reasoning from that that it must be preached. And we're, by analogy, saying that all the members of our churches are preachers in the sense that they can share the good news with somebody. Yeah, all right. Brother, are you going to have a different passage? Acts 1 8, Jesus to his disciples, you will be my witnesses. All right. These are good passages. Yeah, brother? Uh, Davey Lee, a pastor from uh, Papillion, Nebraska, at Oak Hill Church. Psalm 96, 2 and 3. Uh, sing to the Lord, bless his name, proclaim his salvation. Day and day declare his glory in all the earth. Okay, Psalm 96, 2 and 3. I'll tell you one more I thought of as I was trying to think of good passages for this. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 31 to 33. So whether you eat or drink, Paul's not just writing to pastors here, he's writing to the members of the Corinthian church. So what, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everybody in every way, for I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. Paul is wanting to see everything he does, not just his preaching ministry, but everything he does to the end of seeing people saved. I think we teach that people should do all they do to the glory of God. Friends, what brings God more glory than people made in His image hearing the good news and responding in repentance and faith? So I would use that one to hammer home to the people in your church. 
two questions I want to focus on in our brief time this afternoon is what is evangelism and why should we do evangelism? Uh, and what is evangelism? I, I think we can get a simple definition very quickly, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with others so that they'll repent and believe. Uh, but I think when we contrast it with some things that people sometimes mistake for evangelism, we tease out a little more clearly what's going on, and we can help our people understand it better. Very often, the denials and affirmations in the doctrinal statement are more important than the doctrinal statement itself, because the denials and affirmations begin to flesh out what you really mean when you say something. So I think in order to define evangelism well, it's helpful for us to think of, well, what is not evangelism? And the first thing I want to mention is probably the most common objection to evangelism. Is it wrong to impose our beliefs on others? As if evangelism is by nature an imposition. And believe me, I've got uh, not many, but I've got some members of my church who, by the way, they regularly practice evangelism. I understand why people could make that mistake to think that evangelism is, by nature, imposition. Uh, they can be very argumentative, whether or not you're in the mood or wanting to talk about it. But I think we have to understand that what we're doing when we evangelize is we are presenting facts. Uh, we're not giving anything that we've made up. We're not giving anything that's exclusively ours. We're sharing with people the truth. It's not a truth that we invented. So we're, we're heralding this good news. And it's not ours in any sense that, you know, it's unique to us. We're presenting the Christian gospel. So in the Bible, we don't impose anything. Uh, we, we can't. We're telling the good news. I'm not making sure that the other person responds to it correctly. I mean, I wish that I could. But according to Christianity, this isn't something that we can do. Uh, the fruit we know comes from God. As Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 3, what after all is Apollos and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants and he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. This was illustrated to me very clearly by a friend of mine when I lived in England. I had a Muslim friend named Bilal who uh, we were talking one day, and I was uh, just sharing with him how difficult it was to try to raise a family to live a, a faithful Christian life in such a secular country as the, the UK. And Bilal agreed with me. He talked about how corrupt this Christian culture was. And I responded by saying, well, listen, Britain is not a Christian country. In fact, there is no such thing as a Christian country. Well, Bilal seized that opportunity and he said that's really the problem with Christianity compared to Islam. It doesn't provide the answers and guidelines for all the complexities of real life. It doesn't have a, a sort of overarching social agenda. It doesn't give a pattern to society. Uh, and I responded to Bilal that I thought that was because Christianity had a much more realistic portrayal of humanity's condition of the problem of the human situation. He said, what do you mean? I said, listen, Islam has a very shallow understanding of man's problem. Islam thinks the problem is we simply don't do the right things. It's a matter of behavior. We're not submitted. It merely asks a question of the will. Christianity, however, I said, has a much deeper and more accurate understanding of the human situation, which includes a very frank admission of human sinfulness not merely as an aggregate of our bad actions, but as an expression of a bad heart that's in rebellion against God. It's a matter of human nature. Uh, I remember exactly where Bill and I were having this conversation. It was in the grad pad. It was a good conversation. I said Christianity had nothing which Bilal would recognize as a comprehensive political program because we didn't think that the real problem could ultimately be solved by political power. I could put a sword to a person's throat and make them not an ideal but a sufficiently good Muslim, but I couldn't make anyone a Christian that way. The Bible presents the human problem as something that could never be solved by force or coercion 
or imposition. So all I can do is to present the good news accurately and live a life of love towards the person and pray for God to convict them of their sins and give them the gifts of repentance and faith. So true biblical Christian evangelism is, by its very nature, not imposition. It involves no coercion, but only proclamation and love. We are to freely present the gospel to all that we can. Uh, we can't manipulate anyone to really accept it. If we're good speakers, we can manipulate people to do a lot of things that may look like accepting it. But we can't manipulate one single human being to really accept it. Biblical Christians know that they cannot coerce anyone into life. Spend more time on that one because I think that one is often misunderstood. A second thing we mistake evangelism for sometimes is personal testimony. Personal testimony. Now, certainly a word of testimony of what we know God to have done in our lives is a wonderful thing. And it can include the good news, so it can be evangelism, but it may not. In telling people how God has saved us or we've seen God help us, we may not actually make clear God's claims on their lives. And these days people are fine for us to be helped in particular ways so long as we're not implying anything about them or their life. So long as we're not making objective claims about Christ and His death on the cross and what it necessarily means for them. So I, I know these days testimony is good and popular and our kind of that's good for you age. But we need to teach our members that testimony is not necessarily evangelism. And depending on how smoothed off you've made the edges of your testimony, you can make just about anybody happy with your testimony. You can make it sound like a positive thinking thing. But we want it to have the clear edges and angles of the gospel, the cross, uh, of the wrath of God, satisfied by a substitutionary sacrifice. Third thing, some people mistake uh, social action for evangelism. When our eyes fall from God to humanity and social ills replace sin and the horizontal basically uh, replaces the vertical, uh, our practices of evangelism can just become mere crusades for public virtues or programs of compassions or certain stances. Uh, but friends, evangelism is not declaring God's political plan for nations. Uh, with all due respect to some popular authors today. It's a declaration of the gospel to individual men and women who the Lord then brings to Himself and into churches and who in their aggregate often affect society. But if this is, if this is at all unclear to you, uh, just simply rehearse what I said before we were starting, we were having our, our free Q&A time, about different ways Christians can in good conscience think means or rather, ends should best be achieved. Uh, in my church, I can have very conscientious uh, pro-life Democrats and Republicans who want the same good social end and disagree heartily on the means to achieve that end. So it's, it's very hard for us to name anything that we couldn't get a debate up on at Capitol Hill. So it's just, if, if we have message, it is not a particular policy. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is how people can be forgiven and restored to the relationship with God He made us to have. Uh, a fourth thing people sometimes mistake evangelism for is apologetics. Uh, apologetics is answering questions or objections that people may have about God or Christ or the Bible or the message of the gospel. But while such question answering and defending, like sharing your testimony, may often be a part of the conversation that Christians have with non-Christians. And while that may be a part of our own reading or thinking or talking as, as we come to Christ, uh, that doesn't have to be. Some people, when you tell them the message, believe you. It just happens that way. It, it's self-evidently true to them. God gives a divine and supernatural light. I remember I was asked to do a series of evangelistic addresses, a sort of mini-crusade is the language at the time, uh, for the Cambridge Intercollegiate Christian Union back in the early 90s in England. And after my first message from John's Gospel, the student leaders, who were all friends of mine, uh, said to me, Mark, 
you don't, we understand you were an agnostic. You don't really have to teach everybody else how to not believe everything in order to teach them to believe. You can like leave aside all those objections because actually most people may not have those objections. So while it's great that you're willing to answer objections, you don't need to be planting objections in people's minds. <laughs> this is an evangelistic crusade. We would love it if you would just like tell them the gospel. You know, tell them the good news about Jesus. That's evangelism. You know, with a small group with questions afterwards, you can do apologetics. Or with a particularly advertised talk. Well, I thought they gave me good advice. You know, apologetics is responding to the agenda that others set. Evangelism is the agenda that Jesus set. Does not mean if apologetics is wrong. It just means we need to distinguish it from evangelism. Evangelism is following Christ's agenda, proclaiming the good news about Him. It's the positive act of telling people the wonderful way that we can find forgiveness for our sins and adoption through the Lord Jesus Christ. Finally, the last one I'll mention in this is one of the most common and dangerous mistakes <clears throat> is to mistake the results of evangelism for evangelism itself. Evangelism must not be confused with the fruit of evangelism. Now, if you combine this with different understandings about the gospel or any lack of clarity about conversion, then it's possible to end up thinking not only is evangelism seeing others converted, but it, that it's within your power to do that. But friend, according to the Bible, it's not. And evangelism may not be defined in terms of results or methods, but only in terms of faithfulness to the message preached. John Stott has said that to evangelize does not mean to win converts, but simply to announce the good news, irrespective of results. Lausanne defined evangelism as to evangelize is to spread the good news that Jesus Christ died for our sins and was raised from the dead according to the Scriptures, and that as the reigning Lord He now offers the forgiveness of sins and the liberating gift of the Spirit to all who repent and believe. Uh, look over at 2 Corinthians. Open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. We studied these verses in our Wednesday night Bible study just a few weeks ago. We're going through 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one, we are the smell of death. To the other, the fragrance of life. And who is equal to such a task? Interesting, the same ministry, Paul's ministry, has two different effects. It's kind of like the parable of the soils that Jesus tells. Where the guy goes out, he throws the seed. We know the seed is the word. And we can't finally judge the correctness of what we do, it appears then, by the effect that it has. Because the same thing has two different effects. And friends, if we get this wrong here, it can turn our well-meaning churches into pragmatic, results-oriented businesses. And it can cripple individual Christians with a sense of failure and aversion and guilt. As one book puts it, evangelism is not a making of proselytes. It's not persuading people to make a decision. It's not proving that God exists or making out a good case for the truth of Christianity. It's not inviting someone to a meeting. It's not exposing the contemporary dilemma or arousing interest in Christianity. It's not wearing a badge saying Jesus saves. Some of these things are right and good in their place, but none of them should be confused with evangelism. To evangelize is to declare on the authority of God what He has done to save sinners, to warn men of their lost condition, to direct them to repent, and to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, friends, sometimes evangelism is presented as something that's emotionally manipulative, where you merely make a, get the person to make a momentary decision, where the, the sinner's will is, is pressed, but their heart is not changed. But, friends, if we misunderstand what the Bible teaches on conversion, that it's the result of the supernatural, gracious act of God working in the heart of the sinner then we'll certainly get distorted practices of evangelism. The Christian call to evangelism 
is a call not simply to persuade people to make decisions, but rather to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, to call them to repentance, to give glory to God for all conversions. So friends, we don't fail in our evangelism if we faithfully tell the gospel, and yet the person sitting next to us on the plane or on the bus isn't converted. No, we fail in our evangelism if we simply don't tell them the gospel at all. That's the failure. So when you understand that evangelism isn't converting people, though you want to see people converted, but that it's telling them the wonderful truth about God for His glory, the great news about Jesus Christ, that obedience to the call of evangelism then, when you understand that, can become certain. And it can be joyful. Understanding this increases evangelism, I think, as it moves from being a guilt-driven burden to being a joyful privilege. Real evangelism, then, in turn, produces real churches. And real churches help to encourage real evangelism. That's why there can be no realistic conversation about world evangelization without serious consideration of what the Bible teaches about the local church. I want to say that one again. There can be no realistic conversation about world evangelism. It is all just a bunch of fake statistic carelessly assembled. There can be no realistic conversation about world evangelism without serious consideration about what the Bible teaches about the local church. Ian Murray has well observed that evangelism is preeminently dependent upon the quality of the Christian life which is known and enjoyed in the church. I think Murray's right. And in that sense, our churches either help real evangelism or they hinder it. There's a lot more I'd like to say on that, but for purpose of time, I'm going to move on. And if we have time for questions at the end, feel free and bring up a question about that. The other question I want to consider this afternoon is why we should evangelize. What, what's our, our motive? What's our, our goal? You may think, well, Mark, that's a silly thing. Uh, Evangelism is such a good thing. Why spend any time on the motive for it? Uh, How bad can it be to share the gospel? Won't any reason do? Um, Well, I think we can say there's a problem when the motive is wrong. For example, you could have a selfish motive for evangelism. As grotesque as it may seem, you may just want to be right. You may want to win an argument. Uh, You may have had a long conversation with a family member or a friend. You may need some kind of psychological self-reinforcement that you receive when somebody says they were wrong and you were right. You may just want to look spiritual in front of your friends or have a reputation as a successful evangelist if you're a pastor. I I could go on. So what's, what's the right reason for telling the good news? Well, I think we can come up with a number of good motives. And again, if we had more time, I'd just open up. We'd have some good dialogue back and forth quickly. But to save time, I'll tell you three. You can think of more. Number one, the desire to be obedient. Brother at the beginning mentioned Matthew 28. I think that's right. Um, I think you can find other places where it's either commanded or implied that we share the good news. So desire to be obedient. Number two, a love for the lost. Think of Romans 10.1. What Paul says we should have to, would happen to him if only his brethren of the flesh could be converted. Uh, you think of Jesus uh, weeping over Jerusalem. There's a clear love for the lost. Our love is to mirror God's own love for the lost. John 3, 16. God loved the world in this way that He gave His only Son. Finally, though, it's not just a desire to obey God's commands. It's not just a love for the lost. It's also a love for God Himself. A love for God, I think, is the only sufficient motive for evangelism. Because if it's self-love at the motivation, that's going to give way to self-centeredness. Love for the lost will fail with those whom we just find too hard to love. Only a deep love for God will keep us following His way, declaring His gospel. Only our love for God and His love for us will keep us from the dangers which beset us when we desire to be popular, well-liked, respected, uh, at least thought well of, and we're tempted to water down the gospel, to make it more palatable, Then, brothers and sisters, it's only if we love God that we will faithfully stand by His truth and His ways. Ultimately, a desire to see God glorified, which is one of the many reasons I love Desiring God Ministries. 
uh, our desire to see God glorified. I mean, read through the book of Ezekiel. Read, read John's Gospel. Uh, John 15, 8. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Well, friends, we share the Gospel to, to glorify God as we declare the truth about God to His creation. So even if they don't respond in repentance and faith, God is being glorified as the truth is being told, as the refrain is in the Lord's words to us again and again in Ezekiel, that they may know that I am the Lord, that they may know that I am the Lord. That's why these things happen. So the call to evangelize is a call to turn our lives outwards from focusing on ourselves and our needs to focusing on God and those others that He's made in His image and who are yet at enmity with Him, alienated from Him, in need of salvation from their own sin and guilt. And we then bring Him glory as we speak to them the truth about Him and what He has done and what He calls us to do. This isn't the only way that we can bring glory to God, but it is one of the chief ways that He has given us as Christians, as those who know Him and through His grace know Him in Jesus Christ. As Peter exhorted the Christians in the first century for the glory of God, 1 Peter 2.12, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, so you're not even popular, though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits us. Okay, there it is. We should all evangelism. We should all rather evangelize. Evangelism isn't all those other things. It's not that we consider it. It is telling the good news about Jesus, doing it with urgency, with honesty, using the Bible, with joy, living a life that backs it up, praying, being a part of our local church, hoping to confirm the gospel by the life shown in our local church, and we're doing it all for the glory of God. I brought a little booklet with me from my library that I often use when talking about evangelism. Um, it's an old booklet from the 1950s by C.S. Lovett. Soul winning is easy. <laughs> Complete with illustrations, pictures. It's uh, a, a really a soul winning plan, as he calls it, which was based on the sales techniques of the 1950s. He says, and I'm, I'm, I'm quoting from the book here, you are in command. He's talking about the Christian salesman. Quote, in much the same way, the trained soul winner can bring his prospect to a decision for Christ. There is no middle ground as he moves with surety and deftness right up to the point of salvation. It is his conversation control that makes this possible. He knows exactly what he's going to say each step of the way and can even anticipate his prospect's responses. He is able to keep the conversation focused on the main issue and prevent unrelated materials from being introduced. The controlled conversation technique is something new in evangelism and represents a real breakthrough in soul winning. That's on pages 17 and 18 if you want to look it up. He then instructs the earnest Christian about various tools needed and gives some helpful hints like Get your prospect alone. <laughs> Brothers, you laugh, but if you read John Stott's stuff from the 1950s, these little IBP booklets you can't get anymore, John says exactly the same thing. Get your prospect alone in his room. Lock the door. At one point, he teaches them how to press for the decision. He writes, and he's got a picture of this just to make sure you understand exactly what he means and how to do it. Yeah, where is that one? Oh, it's that one right there. You probably can't see it at all, but you'll, you'll understand. He writes, lay your hand firmly on the subject's shoulder or arm. With a semi-commanding tone of voice, say to him, bow your head with me. Note, do not look at him when you say this, <laughs> but bow your head first. Out of the corner of your eye, you will see him hesitate at first. <laughs> then, as his resistance crumbles, his head will come down. Your hand on his shoulder will feel the relaxation, and you will know when his heart yields. <laughs> Bowing your head first causes terrific 
psychological pressure. Close quote. Page 50. How many churches today are full of people who have been psychologically pressured but not truly converted? It may not have been 1950 sales techniques. It may have been cool, hipster youth techniques. But manipulation every bit as much. I know what kind of sales I can close and what kind of sales I can't. And the redemption of an eternal soul is a sale which in my own strength I cannot close. And I need to know that. Not so that I won't preach the gospel, but so that I won't allow the gospel preached to be molded by what finally gets a response. That's what's wrong with too many of our evangelistic and mission agencies. Instead of me using all my extensive powers to convict and change the sinner while God stands back as a gentleman waiting quietly for the spiritual corpse, his declared spiritual enemy, to invite God into his heart, instead of that, I'm going to preach the gospel like a gentleman, trying to persuade but knowing that I can't convert and stand back while God uses all of his extensive powers to convict and change the sinner. Then we'll see clearly who it is that really can call the dead to life. And though he'll use us in doing it, It's not us. He can use anybody and likes to do that for his own glory. He used Moses the stutterer and Paul the Jewish nationalist to reach the Gentiles. I love the story of George Whitfield, the great 18th century evangelist, who was hounded by a group of detractors who called themselves the Hellfire Club. They derided his work and mocked him. They would even gather when he was preaching sort of in the front or on the side, and they would mimic everything. And one of of them was a man named Thorpe, who was mimicking Whitfield one day to his cronies, delivering his sermon with brilliant accuracy, it's reported, perfectly imitating Whitfield's tone and facial expressions when he was so pierced with the truth himself that he sat down and was converted on the spot. Friends, the gospel is powerful, and God is committed to using this good news through our spreading it to every tribe and tongue and people and nation on the earth. So for you as an individual disciple and for your local church, may God help all of us to be involved in the ministry of evangelism. A good fruit of getting this right, church membership that Jonathan was talking about in the earlier session, it begins to regain its meaning because your church begins to be more and more filled with people who are saved, who are regenerate, Sometimes, you know, the charge is leveled. If you're a believer in election, you won't evangelize. You may not hear that up north, but down south where I'm from and in the Southern Baptist Convention, we hear it all the time. But i got to tell you that many of the greatest evangelists in the history of the Christian church have believed that salvation is by God's election. And that has not dulled the evangelistic zeal of a Whitfield or an Edwards or a Carey or a Judson let such a person go listen to Spurgeon's sermon on John 7, 37. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Uh, two days ago was the 110th anniversary of the homegoing of John Patton, one of the great evangelists of the South Pacific Islanders, and a strong believer and preacher of God's election. And more recently, what about a Lloyd-Jones or Francis Schaeffer or John Piper or David Platt? Friends, my concern, honestly, is the opposite. If you don't believe that the gospel is the good news of God's action, the Father electing, the Son dying, the Spirit drawing, and that conversion is only our response to God's giving us the grace gifts of repentance and faith, and that evangelism is our simple, faithful, prayerful telling of this good news, then I'm concerned that you will actually damage the evangelistic mission of the church by making false converts. And if you think that the gospel is all about what we can do with an option that that God has given us and that conversion is simply something that anyone can do at any time, well, then I'm concerned that you'll think that evangelism is nothing, nothing more than a sales job where the prospect is to be won over to sign on the dotted line, to join a program or a certain community, and then be assured that he is the proud owner of salvation. But friends, evangelism is not all about our ability to hawk our religious wares. We know that. Our part is simply to give the message. God will bring the increase. I love the story in Acts 18, you know, when, when Paul was in Corinth and he was, seems maybe discouraged. 
It's interesting to note the doctrine that God actually used to encourage him in evangelism. In Acts chapter 18, verse 9, one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision, Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one is going to attack you and harm you, because I have many people in this place. Friends, God was not simply commenting on the population of Corinth. He wasn't saying, this is a large city, therefore you would say. No, He's saying, I have many people in this place. Friends, in all our churches, we want to see an end to any wrong view of evangelism as if it's simply getting somebody to say yes to a question or to make a one-time decision. We want to see an end to the bad fruit of false evangelism, worldly people having assurance because they make a one-time decision, or church memberships that's markedly larger than the number of those involved with the church, or honestly, just the inaction in our own lives as we ignore the evangelistic mandate, the call to share the good news. We want to see this debilitating, dead coldness to the glorious call to tell the good news end. And we want to see a renewed commitment to and a a joy in the great privilege we have of sharing the good news of Christ with a lost and dying world around us. Friends, you realize we're, we're no longer primarily sinners? Isn't that amazing with our theology? To realize that we are no longer primarily sinners. We now know ourselves to be forgiven, adopted sons and daughters of God. What a wonderful status we have. We want to share that with others. We want to invite them into it. Because someone else was faithful in their evangelism. That's the only reason each one of us is here this afternoon. It's true with every single one of us. So we pray, God, because each of us is faithful this month or this week, that there will be others in our churches if the Lord tarries for this time next year. And if God in His mysterious sovereignty deigns that it not be so, may it not be because we failed in our commission to make Him and His grace in Jesus Christ known to every creature made in His image. Friends, finally, you have to recognize this good news of Jesus Christ and how crucial it is. Uh, Until you do that, I can say nothing helpful to you about evangelism. It'll be no more for you than an unpleasant duty or an occasional impulse. But when the message of the cross captures your heart, your tongue, stammering, halting, insulting, awkward, imperfect as it may be, will not be far behind. As Jesus said in Matthew 12, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. 